familiar faces. If if we haven't met, I'm Patty Smith. I do programming here, but I know a lot of you. Um, <laughs> and we know you too. <laughs> yes. However, we're here to talk about Debbie and um, Antarctica. Debbie and Antarctica. <laughs> and Debbie's actually a Cohasset resident for over 40 years, but has traveled to every continent. Um, and her dream is actually to to travel eventually to 100 countries. 100 countries is the um, next. Yeah. So she is lives in Cohasset, has um, two kids and three grandbabies, and is very happy to be here today. And we're hoping um, she has many, many other travels, you know, beyond just got back from Africa. So hopefully, um, after Antarctica, we can have her do more. But here's Debbie, and welcome. All right. Well, thank you, Patty. I really appreciate the intro, and thank you all for coming. Um, I am hoping this is going to be a whirlwind tour of Antarctica, and so I'm going to jump right in. These are these are my notes, but don't be scared. We're going to go we're going to go quickly. Okay, so um, so Antarctica is actually a polar desert. It actually, the, the, the middle gets one to two inches of snow a year. And, and the peninsula, whoops, I pressed the wrong button here. The peninsula, which is where we were, this is considered the Antarctic Peninsula on, you know, on the continent, but um, this gets about eight inches of snow a year. So a lot of the snow that goes around is actually just blowing, drifting, existing snow. Um, if all this, uh, the ice in Antarctica melted, it would raise sea levels by 200 feet. So we left from uh, Ushuaia, which is the tip of Argentina. Um, they call it uh, Fin del, del Mundo, which is the end of the earth. And um, that is where all the ships um, leave to go to Antarctica. It's also the southernmost town in, the, um, in, in, in South America. So this was our ship. Um, this is a Russian ice cutter ship. And um, actually, they called it a hotel ship by the elite Russians used to go out in Russia on this ship. And it actually had poles on it for pole dancing. Um, now, on this ship were uh, 200 passengers, 120 Chinese who spoke Mandarin. And then the rest of them were from Rhodes Scholar and Gate One. We were from Gate One. So all the lectures, everything that they did had to be done in two, you know, in Mandarin and then in English, which was actually quite interesting. Um, so, so we were warned when we left that this was going to be an extremely rough passage to go through the Drake Passage to get to Antarctica. So we were delayed and uh, for about four hours. And then once we got underway, they changed our route. I'll talk more about that later. But while we were in port, they let us go and tour the bridge. So we met the Russians and uh, the, the Russian captain. And over on the right, I think all this equipment dated from 1940. This is what they ran the ship with. And you know, this is, these are the ships that they do, a lot of them do use because, you know, they're, they, most of the captains that go to Antarctica are Russian. So this is my husband, Tom, who's in the back. Um, this is, they would post um, the tour every, every day where we were going. So right here is the Drake Passage. And that's what we would be going through. That's about 600 miles. It takes about uh, 48 hours. And it is the, one of the roughest, if not the most rough, body of water in the world. It's where the Atlantic and the Pacific meet. So there is a huge rush of water all the time. So we were warned that this was going to be a really rough 48 hours. Later on, we were to find out that it was probably the roughest this captain had ever gone through. 
Um, so we knew there were problems when every five feet they put those brown paper bags out and they were used. I'll tell you, they were definitely used. The seas were 20 to 40 feet. The, um, w as we would go by the dining hall, you could hear the, the plates crashing on the floor and the, um, and the glasses. And I'm thinking, this is, they do this passage a lot. So wouldn't they have stored them better? I don't know, it was crazy. Um, at one point, a whole row of people flipped over in the lecture hall. This was our, our cabin. Um, it, it doesn't really show you that the, the uh, berths are very narrow and uh, for at night, two nights, you kind of had to like lie in position and lock yourself in position so you could stay on them as you pitched and pulled. Okay, um, so it does, the, this picture actually flattened the sea. It, it doesn't look, you know, like how it actually was. But um, some hardy souls, like me, um, went out on the um, after on the on the uh, stern, and we they, they had an ornithologist out there, and sometimes the colleges would come, and he would talk about all the different birds that that are actually out in this Drake Passage. They have um, terns and skuas, fulmers, and the albatross. The albatross is, was obviously the most impressive. This is not my picture, but I wanted to um, explain, you know, that the albatross has a wingspan of 12 feet and it can actually soar for three hours, at, you know, without flapping its wings. It actually flies for the first six years of its life without touching land. It just flies for six years. And then it does start breeding. It can breed up till it's 60 years old and lays its eggs on um, some of the outer islands I'm gonna talk about. Um, it can also smell 12 feet away. So this was the first sighting that we had of any human civilization. We, the first place we went to were the Shetland Islands, which is right before you get to the, the peninsula. This was, this was called the Great Wall, um, and this was uh, the Chinese station. And unfortunately, because they had to change our course and because we had only four hours, um, you know, we, it took us four hours to, to um, get off, they missed their window. So they couldn't go and they were very, very disappointing. That was gonna be the highlight of their trip. So we just watched it from afar. These, um, the, the guy on the left was actually on our cruise and these were slides that he showed us. He spent three years there um, and he said that it was so, it was so miserable that by the end of the winter each year, no one talked. They stay, stayed in their rooms. They didn't eat. Um, and they were just totally miserable. And I like to say the second one was the doctor. And I think he forgot his sunscreen. <laughs> and these were the views that they had out of their windows for over a year, you know, for each year that they were there. And I forgot to say, there's only about 10 people that are there all winter at this great station. But it does swell in the summer. So we're up at the Great Wall. These are the Shetland Islands. The first stop where we went ashore was Deception Island. So this is Deception Island. Can you, does it look like anything to any of you? Does it look like any, you know, a volcano? Exactly. So this is actually a, a live volcano. And um, so it last erupted in 1970. It erupts, you know, every 
uh, so many years. And in the center, the water is so warm that you can actually swim. It's like, you know, it's uh, it pulsates because of the lava, um, you know, ra raising it and lowering it before. Getting ready to go in the parka they gave me. To go in the parka they gave me. So, so what we would do, it, we were given um, waterproof pants and we were given PFDs that were assigned to us and then we, we were given special boots and every time we um, left the ship and when we came back on they were bathed in chemicals so that we wouldn't bring any, um, any bacteria to Antarctica. This is how we traveled. Um, so we were in, in um, small um, inflatables and um, this is how we would go ashore. Um, I'll tell you a little more about that later. So this is, um, this is actually on shore at Deception Island. As you can see, there's not a lot of snow, but there is a lot of volcanic ash. Um, in the, this it was called Whaler's Bay. This is where it was used from the 1800s to the 1940s. So this is pretty recent history that they were doing whaling. And so there were abandoned um, parts of boats on shore and then the white um, is obviously whale bones. These were really creepy. Um, they, they looked as creepy there as they do here. Um, these are what I call Mad Max type structures. This is where they actually stored the whale oil. This, this is um, where they boiled the blubber to make it into, into um, the whale oil. All right, so Deception Island hosts one of the three um, actually, there was two kinds of penguins there, but this was the major one. This is called the chin strap penguin. Can you all see why it was called the chin strap penguin? Um, so there are three kinds of penguins that live on the coast of Antarctica, the gentoo, the adeli, and the um, chin strap, which we saw them all. The big emperor penguin lives, you know, well inland and we wouldn't see them. A fun fact, um, they can swim 50 miles a day to get their food, which is shrimp and krill. These are just some pictures. If you notice, this is, uh, the, this is us in relationship to the boat. So, you know, heading ashore um, and anyway, these are just some shots of cute penguins. So this was just, it was really a, an amazing sight. Um, this was a glacier, I mean, a, um, a gla not a, a glacier, it was an iceberg that was the size, I would say, of New York City. I mean, it's, it was so massive, you, this picture doesn't do it justice. And this was also nine o'clock at night because um, there they are, um, they only get four hours of, of night um, in the summer and four hours of day in the winter. So this, um, we were starting to enter what they call the Arara Passage, which is the beginning of, of the peninsula to get, to get into Antarctica. The crew said this was one of the most beautiful days they had ever seen. Um, every, the thing that was so amazing to me, they shut the engines off and there wasn't a sound. I've, I've never in my life not heard something. Um, so I, um, I, you know, I think that if you could just imagine the complete silence, and it's hard to believe that you would, um, you know, that there was a lot of, you know, animals living there and birds and um, because it's just so silent and it looks so immovable. 
Um, and the other thing that, that we discovered as we went along is that in nanosecond, the weather can change and you can be in a gale. So this is some of the ice that we saw. And do you see the iris iridescent blue? Yeah. yeah, well that's the color of the ice. That is not lighting, it's the actual color of the ice. That, that ice has been compacted over like 100,000 years. So that is actually the color. It is, it is truly amazing to see these pockets um, of, of blue. And if, you t if all the ice, if you were to take the ice sheet of Antarctica, you know, as before, as I said, it could raise the sea level 200 feet, but um, it also contains 90% of the fresh water on, on the planet. And if you spread the ice sheet over the United States and Mexico, it would be 7,000 feet high. So ice is always on the move. It can move 3,000 feet a year, which is a lot, I think. So here is another image of the bright blue section of ice. Um, it is really its true colors. You can see that's not, there's no way that that blue could um, be the light. It is, it is its actual color. Um, it has, the Antarctic Peninsula is only 1% of the continent, but gets 10% of the snow, which as I said, is just about eight inches. So we saw a lot of these really interesting ice formations. Um, this is ancient ice that actually has been formed from meltwater and seawater. And um, what those, these uh, different pockets in it are gases, trapped gases. Now, some days when we were there, it was so warm, we could, it was 50 degree, degrees, and we could wear just sweaters. So it really, it was really, it could be really mild. So one day we were out in the inflatable, and one of these giant pieces of ice, not this one, but one that looked like this, flipped over, which they do on occasion. So if you can imagine, there's like not a sound, and then all of a sudden there's this like unearthly wailing noise. I mean, it's not like a crack. I don't even know how to describe it. It was over pretty fast. And then around the, the uh, snow were all these bubbles, and it was all the escaping gas um, that that um, had been unleashed when the, you know when it started melting with the water. Um, so here, you can see in the background is a, is an ice shelf, and in the foreground were the first things that we saw, the first living things that we saw since we entered Antarctica. They were two orcas. And they came up close to the ship, and they were just frolicking around, which was very cool. Um, so this is this is a picture of the crew scouting out where they were going to bring us to shore, and um, so they would always go out and you know and figure out how we could how we could get up. As you could see, there was a lot of times these sort of big tall ice shelves, so that we wouldn't have been able to get ashore there. The way it worked is, in Antarctica, only 100 people can go on shore at a time um, by law. And so 100, because the crew, it, because there were 200 of us, which was perfect, 100 would circulate around in Zodiacs and the other 100 would go ashore and then we would swap. The other thing is, if you change your itinerary or do anything, you have to, um, you have to let, it, the powers that be know because you have to have permission every time you go ashore. So this is a group of Gen 2 penguins. They, are, they I have to say, they are adorable. Um, now, th these guys walking along there, we couldn't believe it. All of a sudden, they would just turn and just plop down 
off that bank and then land down below and then and then they would take off and go into the water. I mean, I was thinking that's that's pretty pretty crazy. So, Gen 2 penguins are one of the least numerous Antarctic penguins. They're about 300 thousand breeding pairs. They don't stick together like other penguins and sometimes they, they live like they did with the chin straps. And, and the thing is they, all, most penguins breed and have, you know, have um, little penguins, um, <laughs> you know, all in tandem, all at the same time, but these guys don't. And that means that, <laughs> that they don't, uh, sometimes um, their breeding success fluctuates tremendously. They um, nest, and I'll talk more about this later, they nest in, in, in little rock nests and, um, and they lay two eggs. They congregate in areas where there is no snow and they usually, they nest on low hilltops. Um, so it's the weirdest thing that the more sophisticated, you know, the more, um, um, the, the leaders of the penguin colony, the, the older elders, all lived on top of these hills, farther away from the water, more exposed to the birds. It absolutely made no sense. And then, uh, uh, you know, they would have to walk down to the water. They are very, um, they're very awkward. And I will say, when they walk, about every fourth step, they fall over, which is actually a very, it's fun to watch, but I can't imagine being a penguin. makes you dizzy. But the whole, why I did this, not thinking it was going to be for a crowd, it was just to sort of put them in context of where they were. So here is, here is one of those hardy penguins coming from the hilltop down to the water. And um, they were oblivious to us being there. They just scooted right on by. So these, they do wear roads into the, um, into the, into the snow. And uh, we were told they have the right of way. We had to steer clear. This is just another cute penguin picture. So you can see here that, you know, the nests of stones. And it's really funny because they, their big social interaction is stealing stones from each other's nests. And so the male will, you know, bring, bring the female a stone in its beak and be so proud, you know. And, but a lot of times they don't get that stone without a fight. So there's this like battle that goes on. And uh, you know, so it's, it can be quite, um, quite noisy. So this is one of the birds that we saw. This is called a skua. Um, these are really, really huge birds. They're, they have a wingspan of about six feet. This is a close-up. You can't really tell how big this guy is, but you can see he's got this curved beak. And anyone who knows me knows that I have a weird thing with birds. Um, I'll tell you quickly that you know, I was going to Peru for six weeks, and six weeks before I left, a cowbird came and sat on the, on the handle of my back door for six solid weeks, morning, noon, and night. And um, it, was, it was just the weirdest thing. And when I left for Peru, it went away. So my husband wasn't surprised when this skua who was there, this, this guy, um, looked at me and 
he said, that bird's looking at you. And I said, yeah. And he was about 25 feet away. He took flight right at me, flew over my head by a foot, and pooped on my head. <laughs> and then he landed about five feet away, and then he started coming back and waddling around and just chatting. I mean, it was, it was very, very, what can I say? <laughs> So, um, so from um, the next place we're going is the Brown Station, right here. Mm -hmm. So we've crossed down through here, we've come through here, and now we're at the Brown Station, which is actually the southernmost point of where we go ashore. And from Brown Station, then we were going to go to Port Lockroy. Brown Station was not occupied when we got there, and it's owned by the Argentinians. Um, it was founded in or built in 1951 on what is called Paradise Harbor. In 1984, it was burned down completely by a doctor who had been stationed there for a year, and then he was told he had to stay there for another year, and he went totally mad. So they had to evacuate the, the eight people that were living there, and they took them to, the, um, to one of the U.S. stations. This, um, this spot is, the, as I said, the most southernmost part. It's 680 miles from Ushuaia. So here is another picture of the station, it looks really desolate to me. It was really desolate when we were there. Um, and, you know, eight people living there. I mean, just, um, and one of the things we learned is that some of the people on the various stations get together maybe once or twice in a winter and they'll have a, you know, a, a, a dinner just to, to keep their sanity and to see new faces. Um, in the foreground is a Weddell seal. Uh, um, Weddell seals weigh about a thousand pounds and um, they can stay submerged for up to 80 minutes. If they, they do, if they do get trapped in the ice, they actually have to, they scrape the ice with their teeth to keep the, their, it open so that they can breathe. Um, the females will mate on, you know, like an ice flow, and they, they will give birth in um, five minutes. That, I mean, I guess that little seal slides right out. And then um, they actually stay there for six weeks without eating, and the pup is encouraged to go in the water in a, in a week, but, they, um, but they, they stay there without eating. Now, this, these boats were, I don't know if you could call them tied up. They were jammed in there by, I mean, not jammed, they weren't stuck in there, but they were on an ice floe, not even on, um, may, you know, on any land. And um, it, I, I look at that little boat in the foreground, and I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't know how that got there. I mean, I, who would <laughs> go by all those icebergs? And you know, and the ice flows and everything else. But anyway, they were there. So this, um, this, because we were at the southernmost point, they gave us the opportunity for a polar plunge, and about 40 people did it. Um, it the I, the water, I don't know exactly what temperature it was, but it was really, really bitter. And um, so it was kind of, it was fun to watch how long people stayed. I definitely watched the whole thing, did not um, do, you know, try it at all because I thought, we had been warned that if anything happened, nobody could come get us. And I thought, I just don't want to test that out. <laughs> All 
Um, so this is our last trip ashore on the Antarctic Peninsula was at Port Lockroy. And this, this actually serves as the post office, but it's the one place that everybody goes to when they go you know, on this, on this tour. It was built in 1944 as part of a secret mission of, of Great Britain to get a foothold in Antarctica. And today, it's only manned by women. There are eight women that, that stay there. Um, so at the post office, you can buy a postcard. You can get it hand canceled. They have a little red post office box. And when the ship comes by, then they, then they take it off for you. Um, so, so these are the pinups I mentioned <laughs> to some of you. Um, so th this was, they've made it sort of like a museum now. They've made a new bunkhouse for those women. And in that bunkhouse is, there is no internet. There's no running water. There are no toilets. They all live in one room. And um, so it is not for the faint of heart. They, um, it, they basically, this picture is of the original station, and obviously the, you know, the people who were there who were not female um, painted those pictures to keep them company, I guess. Um, so they, somebody wrote, um, they say it's not a cozy posting. For five months they share a single bedroom. There's no running water, no internet, and very little leisure time, one day off every two weeks. It's a very intense experience, says Vicki Ing Inglis, field operations coordinator for the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust, living on top of one another, nowhere you can escape. And then, of course, there's the pungent pong of penguins. At a certain point in the season, the snow goes, and it's not mud, it's all guano, poop from the thousand gentoo penguins living at the base. So. Hopefully, uh, so this is just a um, radio room where they, you know, from 1957. And um, so, you know, very rudimentary um, communications. But I did want to say while we were there um, at Port Lockroy, a gale came up and it was absolutely so intense that you couldn't, you could barely see it in front of you. I mean, when we left, the seas were like three feet high and the inflatable, the snow was pelting and you could barely see the ship. Later on, I have to say there was a little discussion among the crew about whether they should have brought us and um, it, it was intense discussion and they, were, they had talked about making us spend the night there. <laughs> So we continued on after we left Port Lockroy. We took the inflatables to see the last type of penguin called the Adele. Adele's are the smallest and most grace, graceful of the penguins. We did not see them fall down. Um, they both parents, you know, will take turns caring for the eggs. And um, apparently, because they have no natural land predators, they will approach, you know, the scientists. And literally, the, some of the scientists say, you know, they feel like they're being studied. <laughs> so here is a little video. We were bobbing in the boat. Off for the 50 mile swim. <laughs> they take turns going up and down those roads. So 
So near their colony, this was actually the last thing we saw on Antarctica. This is the McMurdo Station. This is um, owned by the United States, one of four stations that we have in Antarctica. Um, it's capable of supporting about 1,250 people. It's got most of the things you would need, um, you know, including even an ATM, but it's got re great research facilities and um, it has about 80 buildings to it. So on the way home, um, back through the Drake Passage, which was much, you know, not, not crazy like it was going over. Um, the crew, the, we, all, we had lectures all the way over. Uh, there was no internet on the ship, of course, so we, we had just lectures and, you know, lots of um, scientists and um, experts who, who talked to us about, you know, what we were going to see. And then on the way back, um, the lectures started to change a lot. And they began to be a lot more about, I think what they were trying to do was make us ambassadors for Antarctica and for the environment. And they started talking a lot about what they were seeing, the disruption of climate change to Antarctica, to the Antarctic, um, about what it's doing to the marine life and, you know, and basically um, the, the, the melting of the, um, of the sea sea ice. And this is actually, I'm almost at the end. So speaking of preserving Antarctica, the last thing they talked about, the last lecture, and they all came into the room, and they talked about the, um, this treaty of Antarctica. It was, it was tr it signed by 12 countries in 1959. Now it has 50 countries that have signed it, and they've all pledged to keep Antarctica for peaceful purposes and education only. Um, and so, so that is set to expire in 2028. And so what they kept saying is, please spread the word, make sure that this treaty is, you know, is uh, reinstated because um, otherwise there are all these countries are up there waiting. They've all staked out claims up there and they're waiting to use them. They're waiting to drill for resources and, you know, like, and they've all, staked out these these claims that uh, they're ready to ready to act on. I think that's what Great Britain was one of the last because they aren't allowing any new um, stations to be built. But you know these countries that are there are really have uh, laid a lot of claim, and you can imagine who's laid the most claim. So this is my final, and I'm just going to read you some, some of my um, feelings about Antarctica. Um, so finally, um, I will always remember the haunting, stunning beauty of Antarctica. I will always think about the eerie silence punctuated with the cacophony of the penguins and the occasional braying seal. I will remember the flashes of blue ice the brilliant sun glinting off the pure white snow, and the surprise treacherous gales that arise without warning. And I will always respect the fragility of Antarctic, Antarctica and pledge to do whatever I can to protect this magnificent place. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.